to be the puppy. It's just outrageous and cute. Yes, sir. Um, question. So, how, how do we. So, serial homology implies duplication and possible subsequent modification of the trait. In the case you discussed, how do we know that they're actually distinct duplications as opposed to a single trait that's being used for many things? Um, that's a good question. I would say that the, the remember that I said at the beginning, emotions have these multiple features, and, and that gives us leverage in trying to ask questions about them. So eliciting conditions and outcome behaviors are pretty different, right? Um, uh, you know, the, the, the cue properties of, um, you know, seeing your you know, reproductively aged opposite sex sibling naked um, are completely different than the cute properties of, you know, a plate of yellow paint and with red flecks in it, right? Um, and the changes in behavior are similarly different, okay? So, um, uh, although we lose appetite in both situations, right, the loss of appetite is in a different domain, okay? That is, it's loss of sexual appetite versus loss of food appetite. So if it were just that these are all different facets of one kind of hydra-headed adaptation, it would be hard to see how the system had that kind of specificity, right? So, I mean, we, right. it, it's possible that the same machine just has sort of separate channels of input and output, and I'm not sure that that's really all that different from serial homology with regard to a, a mental mechanism. I'm not making any claims about, you know, neuroanatomy or anything like that. Did that answer the question? Yeah, so, 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 the, so there could be different, in, the idea that there could be different inputs routed to the same area, say, anatomically, that's consistent with this idea. Right, so I think, um, I, I think if one were to look at it, you know, with regard to the actual physical architecture of the system, yeah, probably what you would see is, um, that what we're describing as serially homologous adaptations are in fact um, overlapping in the physical architecture, right? That is, they share components. It would be surprising if they were. So they, they aren't like those body segments in that regard, where they're complete duplications, right? It'd be remarkably inefficient to have to duplicate, you know, the, the single machine that generates rejection right, over and over and over again instead of just having different inputs. But I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the level of, you know, cues and behavior and function and not at the level of the actual neural architecture. So I don't have any stake in that set of issues. Yes, Jim. So how do you, how much, I guess I'm not wondering what the definition of disgust is. And, and that goes back to the, versions in other animals that would imagine would would um, correspond to the original function of disgust and the first derived function of disgust. Well, but I don't know, so I was actually curious what Susan would think about in breeding variants and how that's manifested in monkeys. So I mean they don't Mate very much with close relatives, but is there any capturing analog of disgust? Do you think? Um, I don't know that there's sexual disgust. Is anything here? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing is that they have this non-conceptive sex with often with these partners that they avoid during the conceptive phases. Mm -hmm. So that's more mysterious to me. I mean, clearly you see disgust. I don't think so. I think that's consistent with the story I'm telling here, right? So if you think about the, you know, finding with Carlos where we showed that, you know, sexual disgust and inbreeding was one of the elicitors there, right? That that peaks around conception. There, there, you know, there may be, there may be positive aspects to the behavior, right? So affiliation and, you know, um, alliance formation and so on. There may be positive aspects to the behavior outside of a conceptive window. So if there, it, it's going to be a trade-off between the costs and benefits. If there are positive benefits to it, and there aren't the costs of inbreeding depression, then the fact that they mate 
yeah. when they're not fertile doesn't tell us whether or not they're experiencing you know a sexual disgust pattern. Right? Um, I, I I should say there's there's evidence in both directions. Okay, and this will this paper that Jason and I are working on will present some of this. So um, uh, the evidence against consistent with your skepticism is well, that. I was just wondering. Well, I, that's what I'm trying to figure out. How do you know you've gone from? You know, is there a is there a principal distinction between aversion that leads you to not do certain <clears throat> things and discuss? Right. So let me let me give you yeah. two kinds of, of evidence. One is that there are stereotypic behavioral patterns that uh, rodents engage in when they're poisoned. Okay. Um, they they can't vomit. Um, rats can't vomit. Um, it's kind of odd. You would think you know here's this generalist like us. You know. But they can't. Um, they do this pawing behavior when you poison them. Okay? And they don't do that in the context of um, uh, any kind of sexual avoidance. Okay? So you don't see anything that looks like a dis disgust display, um, if we want to call that toxin avoidance some kind of very primordial disgust, in the, in the context of avoiding mating with individuals um, that they were co-reared with. Okay? So that speaks against this claim. Okay? It's negative evidence. It's, it, it, it doesn't support this position. There's also positive evidence, which is that, um, so I'm sure you're all familiar with the Garcia effect. Um, you know, if you give a rat lithium chloride, in one trial learning, it develops a selective condition taste aversion, avoids eating that thing. Okay? And it's unique to that conditioning process. So if you shock it, if you give it a novel food and then give it an electric shock or something, it doesn't develop an, an aversion. It requires the poisoning system. Okay? If you um, allow it to mate and then give it lithium chloride, it avoids that individual in the future as well. Okay? So it looks like there's something like the Garcia effect in the sexual domain, which is consistent with the claim that there's this overlap between these systems. Um, it's only the poisoning system in that regard. It's not just, gee, I had a bad experience, you know, that, 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 that was, you know, that was a rat I shouldn't have gone home with, as it were, right? Um, it's just the poisoning experience, okay? which looks like an overlap between an ingestive system, an ingestive regulation system, and a mating regulation system. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, when we look just at the behavioral manifestations, we don't see the evidence. Now, this is an understudied question from my perspective. Jason has worked pretty hard um, kind of polling a bunch of people <coughs> working on rodent behavior, just rodents, you know, because they're the best study. Uh, and, you know, we haven't, we, we've only turned up negative evidence in that regard. We haven't turned up any positive evidence. So for the first one, the, the heroin, um, so they pop, so they get poisoned by something. When they see that food again, do they start pawing? Is that a disgust reaction? It says just somehow, you know, I really like to puke, but I can't, so I'm just going to pop. <laughs> no, I, 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 I know, I should know the answer to that, and I, I don't know the answer. I should, so, yeah, unfortunately, I just, Jason has gone back to Osnabrück, or we could ask him. Yeah, yeah. But um, I should, I, I don't know the answer, I'm sorry. I don't want to, you know, guess and be wrong. So, so something special that gets some aversion to discuss. When do you stop calling it the boys? I mean, this is a hard question about animal emotions in general, right? Is when do we, I mean, you said it analog in asking Susan the question about inbreeding. I mean, technically it would be a homology, not an analogy by the argument that I'm making here. Um, and the question of when you see a homology in, uh, in an animal with regard to emotion is a difficult one. I mean, Franz Duval just published a paper on this claiming that, you know, Basically, we need to break the taboo in animal behavior and start talking about emotions in animals. But, you know, I mean, Franz thinks lots of things about chimpanzees that I mean, I'm not sure that everyone who studies them agree with him about. I think it's, it's hard, okay? Uh, you know, aversion is just a description of a preference based on a pattern of um, a, a, attraction or avoidance. It isn't a description of any kind of true internal state. Okay? Um, and, you know, to the extent that People are starting to do a sort of facial action coding system for chimpanzees, for example. Maybe we're starting to get to the point where we can have some kind of more objective measurement of animal emotions. But it's a long way from having any direct evidence. I mean, you know, a lot of what we know about human emotions is on the basis of either asking people, right? So they use the same metaphors to describe different states. They, you know, they talk about the same, you know, gastrointestinal 
distress, for example, or clever experiments like the Schnall or Zhang experiments, where you know we have this elaborate system of elicitors that tells us, okay, we know we've elicited emotion number one. Now let's give people task number two and see whether emotion number one affects task number two. That's you know it's hard to do with people. It's even harder to do with animals. I don't think it's impossible. I just think we're not there yet. Yes, John. Um, I, I was going to suggest that maybe anatomy could sort some of this out. It's always dangerous because of degeneracy and, and you're getting different systems producing the same outputs. But without, I haven't looked a lot at the um, anatomy underlying uh, discussed, but there's the area of the stream in the brainstem is probably pretty old. And then uh, there are also discussed um, reactions in the insula. And the insula is, you know, in humans is quite developed. But this, with animals, with, with rats, you could, you know, see, see what's going on perhaps by uh, some kind of thing planted electrolytes or something. Yeah, um, I, I mean, my skepticism in that regard stems from the fact that these systems are, are um, multifunctional, right? So the insula does lots and lots of things. So if we were to lesion the insula and see whether it affects inbreeding avoidance, you know, positive evidence I don't think would necessarily be strong support for this position because probably lesioning the insula does all kinds of things, um, you know. But it depends on where you're leaching and how big the lesion is. That can be played with. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't claim expertise in neuroanatomy, but my understanding is that there's an awful lot of overlap, that there aren't discrete circuits at present identified. It's a big problem. True. Rob, you had your hand up. Um, so, uh, a suggestion, a question. Is the suggestion, here's an alternative hypothesis about the, the link between toxin ingestion and pathogen content. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I think it's still true that uh, chimpanzees hunt but don't scavenge. Um, and um, most other carnivores are, you know, 50% scavengers, 50% hunters, at least the big ones. Um, and they presumably had or they or their ancestors have had detoxification machinery in their gut for a long time. So an alternative hypothesis would be you take a frugivore and, and in you know, fairly short order, a few million years, you make it into a carnivore, starting with forest carnivore like a chimpanzee. They just don't have it. It's not the costly uh, tissue hypothesis. It's, there's a lot of evolution that needs to go on to produce a, a you know. And so, and so the, 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 the prediction would be Chimps should have it too. Uh, chimps and other carnivorous uh, or semi-carnivorous uh, primates also need to avoid pathogen contact uh, because they don't have this stuff. <coughs> They're eating meat. The only piece of evidence I have is they don't scavenge. Yeah. But, okay, so that, that's just offer you a free hypothesis. The question is a real question, which is, so I once tried to eat Cervantes beetle grubs. I failed, I have to say. I really had a hard time getting them past my lips. Uh, they were really disgusting. And you know, but all these brie and other things that ought to, you know, just, you know, are very strong uh, uh, cues. It's runny, it's yellow, it stinks, it stinks. You know, so, so, I mean, and presumably there's, I mean, I know there are people who think cheese, their cultures, but cheese is just, you know, it's like brie, just regular cheese is disgusting. And, Maybe some of those people think you're going to break the uh, So there's a, seems to me there's a fourth category here someplace, which are um, not moral norms, but there are norms about what's food uh, 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 or practices about what's food or something. And I wonder how you fit that into your... Well, I would say that I, I think that, um, that this system in humans is open to cultural input because, for example, the diet is so widely variable in our species. And, and you know, as a baby born into the world, you can you can be pretty confident that people around you know what to eat and what not to eat. Yeah, sure. um, and so you rapidly acquire discussed reactions to things that people characterize as not food. Now, that of course can get exploited down here in the same way that you know, reactions to outgroup members, the same thing, right? So, you know, our people don't eat that. That's disgusting. The people on the other side of the river eat that. And there's no question that there's powerful framing that goes on that connects these things. Paul Rosen has a wonderful experiment where he had um, pen 
psych student sniff, I think it was valeric acid, if I remember, which you know is this foul smelling chemical, and mm -hmm. tells half the subjects that this is a fine French cheese, and they, ah, oh, that's fine, yeah, very fine, I can detect the woody <laughs> overtones. And he tells the other half of the subjects that it is um, uh, sweaty gym socks, right? It's exactly <laughs> the same stimulus, and people are, you know, their, their guts start to rumble, and their faces <laughs> fall, and, right? But because the cultural framing of whether this is food or not food, and, and what you think of it, so strong. So, I mean, I, I agree with you on that, um, I, I, but I'm not sure that it is fundamentally a different story than the one that I have here right now. Um, your suggestion about you can't get there from here with regard to the gut issue is an intriguing one. And um, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've gone back and forth on that issue. Um, uh, so Joan tells me that bad wounds will eat anything, including, you know, nasty, disgusting, rotting meat. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, it seems that capuchin males hunt a lot more than females, which is, um, you know, a pattern that we see in chimps as well. It might be because of the affordances of carrying babies and such in chimps, but the capuchin hunting doesn't seem like it suffers the same limitations. You know, I don't have a good explanation for the robust sex difference in disgust sensitivity in humans. I have some ideas, but I don't think any of them are that strong. But maybe there's something like that in other critters as well. I don't know. It, you know, don't have a s strong evidence for an answer. But um, yeah. Peter, I'm afraid that, yeah, we're actually past time, so I'm happy to talk to you after. Thank you, guys.